So I think it's my job. It's the first line on my job description is to tell the deepest truth. This is A New Angle, and I'm your host, Justin Angle, marketing professor at the University of Montana. This podcast is my chance to speak with cool people doing awesome things in and around the great state of Montana. We are proudly underwritten by First Security Bank and Blackfoot Communications. All right, welcome back. Thanks for tuning in. Before we get to today's episode, just another reminder, if you like what you're hearing, please help us out with a review, help us out with a share, just telling your friends. Visit a new angle podcast.com and drop us a line through the uh, feedback form. Uh, we just want to hear what you think of the show and how we can make it better. And uh, again, help us spread the word and grow the audience. Anyway, today's episode, I am super jazzed about. I got the chance to speak with best selling author Cheryl Strayed, author of Wild, Brave Enough, Tiny Beautiful Things. She writes this really important advice column called Dear Sugar. Uh, Cheryl was here to give the presidential lecture series speech uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I was fortunate enough to get some time on her calendar. She was super generous with her thoughts, with her insights, and her wisdom about writing, about how to be truthful about grief, how to get to the essential truth of human emotion. And it was a conversation that uh, I really enjoyed, and I hope that you will too. So without any further ado, I bring you Cheryl Strait. Okay, so we're here today with Cheryl Strayed. Cheryl, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's a delight to be here. You know, I was really uh, bummed that I didn't get to meet you in person during your recent visit, but gosh, you really brought the house down Monday night as the presidential lecture series speaker. And I got to say the community here, campus, the town, everybody's buzzing about your, your visit. So thank you. Oh, I am so delighted and touched to hear that. Thank you so much. It was it was an honor to speak to such that that full house. I think all the seats were taken and it was just really heartwarming to look out and see all of those uh, beautiful faces there on Monday night. Yeah, and that has to be, I mean, I'd love to kind of get into that with you. It's It's got to be really interesting from your standpoint, uh, you know, with the success of all your writing and your work to now be kind of welcomed into the many communities as an inspirational speaker. I mean, you have, you've developed quite a platform. That has to be new for you. Yeah. And it's one that I, you know, I, I really kind of, when I say I developed it by accident, I don't in any way mean to diminish the fact that I've also worked incredibly hard for a long time. Yeah, yeah. But I certainly, when I uh, began as a writer, I never imagined myself as a public speaker or even as someone who would be inspiring to other people. That was something that happened that was sort of born of the response to my work. And I realized that people um, wanted to to really hear me, uh, I guess, talk about some of the the experiences and the values that that are you know sort of underlie my approach to writing and life and art. And so yeah, it, I, I feel like I sort of accidentally became an inspirational speaker. And and I'm always uh, honored when people say they found whatever I had to say or or whatever I wrote that they found it inspiring. Well, and and that's I mean. That really speaks to it. I, I've been familiar with your work. I've read Wild and just just really kind of just amazed by it's just the power of the writing. But I, until that presentation on Monday, I really had no idea kind of the cultural force that you, you are in, in in this community in particular. Um, one moment we were we were just discussing before we went on air about this this young woman. She's here. She moved from uh, Vermont to to Missoula and is working for AmeriCorps and she got up basically to ask a question and had no question to ask other than to tell you how much that you've inspired her. And, and that has to feel pretty darn special. And then um, it also speaks to people are really kind of buying into your, to your, to your work and uh, finding inspiration there. Yeah. And what's interesting to me is that, you know, as of course she stood up and she told us, about both of her parents dying. And that's always, every time I meet somebody who talks to me about their loss or their struggles with with any number of issues, many of these things that I've written about in Wild or Tiny Beautiful Things or any of my work, I always feel honored that I'm getting to have that that individual interaction with a reader. 
But what I've also learned is she is so not alone that I've met right. people like her all over the world. And it's been a really moving experience to see, you know, we experience our losses and our sorrows, obviously, individually and originally. But what I've seen is how universally we are connected, not just through our joy and our triumphs, but through our suffering. And so when I have an experience like that, I, I meet that young woman in Missoula, uh, and, but I've met hundreds of thousands of her sure. all around the world. So there is that thing where it's always um, the specific is the universal. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, along those lines, you got to spend time directly with, with some of our students, the students in the Davidson Honors College. And part of our, you know, your book, Wild, was the Grizz Read, which meant that all freshmen sort of read it at the same time and have going, been going through a curriculum built around that experience. Um, you know, one of the things I was thinking about is what went on in that classroom? Did you get any good questions from our students? Any, any that surprised you? Oh, yeah. I always get great questions um, from young people when I visit classes. And I loved so much how vulnerable they were in their questions. I think that that's one of the my favorite things about what happens when people engage with my writing, because I'm so honest and vulnerable in it and, and really writing about things that we often don't talk about, especially talk about in in situations like you know, college classrooms, right, essentially right. the emotional, the emotional life, uh, the inner life. And what happened in both of those rooms, I, I talked to the Honors College, like you said, and then also to, to students, uh, both undergraduates and graduate students at a Q&A, they all came with questions that were really kind of bold and really emotionally risky and asking me sometimes, um, you know, what is the meaning of forgiveness? And how do you, uh, how, how have you um, healed some of those wounds um, from your past? And really in some ways by asking me those questions, um, seeking counsel. And I think that sometimes that doesn't get to happen very much in an academic setting. And, and what I know to be true as somebody, especially in my work as Dear Sugar, I, I have an, I write an advice column that's collected in my book, Tiny Beautiful, Beautiful Things, and, and my podcast. Um, you know, I've really had the opportunity to talk to a lot of people about their inner lives and about their struggles. And I, I, I think that those things, um, even though we make them invisible in an academic setting, they are not invisible who we are and what we're struggling with and what we're afraid of is always with us. And it's certainly with us as we're on those learning journeys that college students are. And so it, it felt like a privilege to talk to many of them were, you know, 18 years old. I couldn't believe when I said I was telling them about my Pacific Crest Trail hike in 1995. And I said, well, how old were you all then? Right, right. And they, and they <laughs> Not were like, born yet. Oh, we weren't born. And I said, <laughs> you know, that's impossible. But um, it is possible, it turns out. Yeah, I'm starting to see birth dates on transcripts that uh, have a two at the beginning, and it's it's very depressing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and speaking, you know, I, as I, as I said, I wasn't at those student events, but there's one student at your talk that got up and and asked such a courageous question, and and a part of the story that you might not have seen. It was the student that asked you about uh, your mother's ashes and the scene from the book when you when you swallowed the ashes or the you know the the, the, the leftover yeah. bone fragments, and that was a powerful moment. But that that student was on the side of the room in front of us, sort of sobbing trying to gain the courage to, to ask you that question and to see her kind of step up and, and be so vulnerable in that moment was, was really inspiring. Wow. Yeah. I, I really have gotten used to people having that kind of reaction. And I think it really is. I, I talked about this Monday night in so many ways by me writing very honestly about my grief and my loss, what happens is not that people are so interested in what happened to me, but it opens up for them what happened to them. Right. And they are, they are put in touch with uh, their own losses, which, you know, I think is, that's everything I ever wanted to be as a writer, to make that kind of impact on other people's lives. And how do you know, that's something I was thinking about. You mentioned that particular part of, of the book being, you, you know, you, you, you wrote that sentence or that paragraph or that passage and you felt like it was too much. And you had this mm -hmm. great, great expression in your great phrase in your talk. You said, well, that's the job of art. And it got me thinking like, how do you know as a writer when you're approaching that? And how do you know when you 
get it and you know and then I, I suppose at that point there's a question of if if and how it will resonate with others yeah there's a kind of popular phrase that I heard a lot when I was uh, an undergraduate and graduate student and really apprenticing myself to the writer's craft and it was uh, no tears in the writer no tears in the reader and I think that that's um, hmm. really kind of true yeah. when I know I've written a passage, a scene, a chapter, a sentence that electrifies me or makes me feel like, oh, you know, like that sense of terror or, or, or fear or sorrow. I know that it's, I've, I've told a very powerful truth and that I've really taken uh, that courage all the way to the limits. And very often, as I said on Monday night, my first impulse is to protect myself. Sure, to say, naturally. It's too much. Okay, you know, I swallowed my mother's ashes. I swallowed a handful of my mother's ashes. I'm not allowed to say that. I'm not allowed to write that because people will think this is too much. This woman is crazy. And every time I've done that, you know, I first say I'll, I'll have to take that sentence out or that scene out. And I, then the next voice is, no, it's actually... The, the thing you absolutely have to leave in mm -hmm. because it's a really important thing that you tell the deepest, deepest truth, the truest thing. And I've never, ever, ever been wrong about that. And that doesn't mean that sometimes those moments don't get criticized by some people. For some people, it is too much. But yeah, it is it is art's job to challenge us. For, for most people, I will say that scene with the ashes, I've had a few people criticize me for it, mock me for it. Mm -hmm. I've had a whole lot of people, and here again, all over the world, across every boundary of culture, race, class, gender, religion, I've had all of those people have come to me and said, I can't believe you wrote that because I felt like I was the only one. I thought I was the only one who'd done anything like that because yeah. I did it too. Right. And and that's, you know, that's what makes it worth it for me. I know that art is about pushing those limits about what we're allowed to say about who we are and what we are and how we really love and how we really lose and how we really suffer and how we really triumph. So I think it's my job. It's the first line on my job description is to tell the deepest truth. And how did you, how did you learn that that was the style and form and sort of ethic that you wanted to bring to your writing? Well, I think it's always been my natural impulse. Okay. It, it goes way back to my my earliest self. I used to get my mother would have to talk to me and pull me aside. And even as a young young kid, I would I would sort of corner her friends and and say, you know, like I would get a couple in the corner and be like, well, why do you really love each other? You know, mm. I would want to know. <laughs> yeah. I would. We're getting know questions like that from our daughters right now. They're six and eight, and they're starting yeah. to. They're, they have these like the questions have such innocence, but they cut really deep. Yeah, and and I've always been so madly curious about not who are we, but who are we really? Yeah. And I've that's that's really been my obsession all my life is you know what's happening inside the secret self and. You know, there's always the public face we show to the world. And I don't mean people are false or fake. I sure. just mean, you know, we all have to present a face to the world. And what I'm curious about is what's happening behind that face and in that body and in that mind and in that heart. And so, you know, it began there. And then the writing I loved most took those kinds of risks as well. And I started to apprentice myself to that craft and to do it's, you know, writing is so much trial and error. Mm -hmm. Um, for me to figure out too, I mean, I think one of the most complicated things when we talk about this is a lot of people misunderstand what that means when I say, when I talk about being emotionally vulnerable and honest on the page, that's a very different thing than saying, okay, I'm going to sit here and write down like all the terrible things that have ever happened to me and all the terrible things I've ever thought or done. And that's art. And that isn't art. Uh, this isn't about just pouring out, um, everything in a sort of confessional, un, un, uncrafted um, form. I, I'm not advocating that. I'm advocating, you know, really a high level of, of consideration and craft, but always going to that place where you are being as vulnerable and honest as you can possibly be. And you're making big contributions to kind of how we conceptualize and think about and talk about grief and grieving. And, you know, I came up a couple times in the discussion on Monday was, 
you know, hey, the way that we as a society um, grieve and talk about grief is, is, is kind of broken. And um, I wanted to ask, like, what, what do you think are the, the right ways? Like, how should we be modeling grief and grieving in our children and in our communities? I think that we need to move away from this idea that we can protect people from their suffering. And so often when we're trying to protect people, what we're doing is, is actually isolating them and silencing them and ignoring what's very real for them. And what I mean by that is I felt that when my, my mom died when she was 45 and I was 22 and I really was in so much pain. I mean, I was mm -hmm. in so much pain. It felt as if I could hardly breathe. And yet if you knew me during that time, you know, you would see me and I would seem to be functioning. Sure. I would seem to be, you know, I, I went to school and I did my job and I attended potlucks and, you know, I did all the things that people do. And I think it's because people don't, didn't, you know, they didn't want to in some ways incite my sorrow. So they would, you know, pretty quickly after my mom died, stop mentioning it, okay. <laughs> stop, you know, acknowledging that what was actually here again, you know, there's the public face and in the inner life. And what was actually happening for me is that I was in an, in an incredible amount of pain. And I just wanted people to even say my mother's name. I named my daughter Bobby after my mom, really not just to honor my mom, but just so that word would be back in my life sure. again. I felt wow. in so many ways, the people who wanted to help me grieve thought that the best way to do that was to make my mom invisible. And what happened to me, so you know, I learned it through experience that we need to do better with grief, but I really learned it when I started writing honestly about my grief, which I did in, in a couple of my first personal essays, which I wrote in my late 20s and early 30s, um, essays that had um, a big impact in terms of, you know, hundreds of people writing to me, mm -hmm. maybe now thousands of people writing to me in response to those particular essays. And what they said is, I can't believe, you know, I've never heard anyone say about grief what you said, and it's exactly how I feel. And what struck me is how many of them said nobody had ever said that to them. Nobody had ever validated what is actually a very, very common experience that people feel deeply alone and isolated in their sorrow. And what that told me is we do not have a language uh, for grief, really. Right. We don't, we're, we're uncomfortable with having a conversation about, you know, what does it really mean? And what I always, the advice I give people when they say, well, how do I help this person, um, my friend or my partner or whoever who's lost someone, I always say, you know, make visible what what the culture makes invisible you mm -hmm. know be brave enough to say on mother's day hey i'm thinking of you i know it must be hard to have mother's day when you don't have a mom and i just want you to know i'm thinking of you yeah. and that has made all the difference in my life the people who have just spoken up said something i know it's scary i feel scared too sometimes when i do it with friends who are bereaved but it's worth it because it makes those people feel less alone yeah, and it's such, I mean, the, the wisdom there in many ways is so simple and, and obvious, yet it's so difficult for us to recognize it. And, and that, to me, it goes back to the, the questions our children are asking us, right? They're so pure and so clear. You know, like yeah. when a kid asks you, where do babies come from? Like, that's a simple question, and, and like, we shouldn't have a complicated answer. We should just tell them how they happen, yeah. right? Um, but yet, as, I agree. as, as we <laughs> I, age, I did. yeah. As we age, it's just like these layers of, I don't know, like norms and expectations and stress and anxiety all kind of get us wrapped around the axle in such a way that we're dysfunctional in, in relationships. A New Angle is underwritten by First Security Bank and Blackfoot Communications, two cool companies doing awesome things all over Montana. Hey, this is Jeff Petticord, and you're listening to A New Angle. Absolutely. I agree entirely. And, you know, the other thing I've always, I have two kids who are 13 and 14. And from the very beginning, I told them the truth about death and my mom's death uh -huh. and about my grief and about sex. And one of the things that I've learned is it's a lot easier actually to tell them about all of these things. So much easier. When, you know, they're three, four, five, six. Explaining sexual intercourse to my kids when they were four and five and six is what, that's when I did it. Uh, was so much easier than having to talk to them now about sex. Because yeah. of course now they're like, oh, mom, no, I still do it. But 
at least I got those logistics down before they were repulsed. Yeah, you by got it. the, the basic mechanics any, out of the way. Yeah, yeah. We're, it's funny. We're sort of working through that exact stuff right now, and it's you're right. It's it's you just gotta. And that's funny. We had so my my older daughter Ainsley. So we lost my my wife's father. I don't know. It's about seven years ago, and so our our daughter Ainsley was about two years old at the time. And we sought some advice on how to talk to her about it. And, and, a, and a psychologist that we spoke to said, you have to be concrete. Just tell her exactly what's happened, that her, her grandpa has passed away or died, and he will not, you will not talk to him or see him again. And, and I felt like the process of explaining this to our daughter in concrete terms and making the effort to make it clear and concrete actually helped me deal with my own grief and help my wife deal with her own grief in the, in the, in the sense that it just cut the issue down to its truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's, we forget how recent that kind of advice is. Yes. My grandmother died when I was three and there was a very different message. The parents were being told, well, don't, don't mention it. Don't bring her to the funeral. Don't, you know, yeah, just say exactly. she's gone away on a trip, you know? And I think that that kind of, uh, idea that we're protecting children. I mean, I don't think that any intentions were bad, but I think that that's wrong because of course we do know when somebody is gone and we'll never see them again. And, and we can either have bewilderment around that and a sense of, of confusion and isolation, or we can have honesty and openness and the ability to talk about the emotions that arise when you have to tell somebody you're never going to see that person again. And right. we're all going to die. That's another one. I mean, how do you tell your children that they're going to die someday too? That's a really profound <laughs> thought. I mean, I think a lot of adults haven't really wrapped them, their minds around that. Mm -hmm. But I think if we start early, you know, talking about mortality and about the death process and the birth process, and it's interesting, we're talking about how do you explain sex to your kids? How do you explain death to your kids? It, they're both, you know, two ends of the same thing right. of a life. And and I think that I guess I just what I've learned in my life is every time you 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 do express the simple truth, uh, it, it always leads to good things. Yeah, without a doubt. And, and as we as we're talking about that, it makes me think about something that stood out to me as as a, either a device or a feature. Um, of your work, and that is the sort of study or expression of contradiction. Um, you know, the scene yeah. with the backpack sort of seems like the the crux, one of the crux pieces of Wild. You know, you've got this backpack, and you need all these things to do the thing you need to do, and then you, you can't lift it. And uh, you know, and you use the phrasing, you know, you have a situation where you have to do what you cannot do. And, and can you talk about that as sort of a as a piece of, as a literary device, but also as a, as a reality to the truth that you're trying to tell. Yes, and, and that, that sense of two things, two contradictory things being true at once is something that comes up over and over and over again in Tiny Beautiful Things as well. Right. And, and my work as Dear Sugar, trying to help people see their ways through their various problems, you know, because the truth is, is life often presents us with that. You know, how do you, how do you live with, without someone you feel you can't live without? I mean, mm -hmm. that's a question everyone ha who's ever had their heart broken <laughs> has faced. Everyone who's ever had someone um, die who they love has faced. And what we know is it feels like you can't and you don't want to sometimes. And what, but we, what we also know is that almost always you do. And you find a way. And I think that that is, you know, so much contained in that in that kind of notion, you know, the very real fact that I did have a backpack I couldn't lift that yeah. sat alongside the very real fact that I had a backpack that I had to lift. And so, you know, the beauty, I think, of life is always finding a way to, to hold those two truths, to honor them both, to say to say to look them straight in the face and say, I know these I know that's true and that I'm going to, like, make my way along the middle holding both of you and that is, you know, that's a theme I didn't really necessarily think of intentionally. It's one that simply emerged sure. as I was tossing around so many of the, the things, you know, not just in the backpack, like in Wild, I write a lot about my first marriage uh, that, that ended not because, uh, you know, I, I didn't love my ex-husband. It ended because I, I needed 
to leave that relationship, even though there were all these great things about it. And I mm -hmm. think that that was what was so hard for me to say, like, this can be true. And this other thing is also true. Right. And I need to uh, find a way uh, to live with both of them. And how do you explain, I mean, going back to our children, how do you explain that to your children when they start to come up against those, those realities of the complexities of life? It's hard, you know, and I think it's, it's interesting because, you know, I, I do think it's something I, I talk to my kids about. I actually just talked to them last night. I got back from Missoula. It just so happens my ex-husband, speaking, speaking of my ex-husband, uh, lives there and he right, was at the right. talk and I saw, I saw him yesterday and his wife and um, we had a wonderful visit and I told my kids uh, w when I got home that I had seen my ex-husband and it was really interesting the way they knew he existed, but they both made these like terrible faces and they mm. said, well, why would you do that? Wasn't that awkward? And I said, no, you know, it can be like you can you can be deeply connected to somebody and you can decide to change the terms of your relationship. And then you can see them again. Like it, you can do all of these things. We are capable of all of these sure. things. And I think that the reason they squinched up their faces is of course they've received by the culture, a, a very different narrative about, for example, romantic love. Like, you know, you break up with somebody and, and you demonize them and they're part of your past and you never, uh, you never have, uh, you never look back. And, sure. and I think that, you know, obviously sometimes that's the case, but in, in many times it, it isn't right. Uh, in many, in many cases, you, you feel grateful for the people uh, you knew and loved along the way who taught you things you needed to know. And, and I think that, you know, when possible, again, you know, it's not always comfortable that you have to sort of expand the heart and the mind when possible, you know, hold those truths together. And so, you know, I think with my kids, I can tell them about that. And then they're probably just going to have to live their lives and learn it themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that would seem to be true. It, it seemed that the, 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 that the instinct of squirming or you know, being uncomfortable in that moment was their sort of effort to protect you. Yeah, probably. Right? Or the feeling that they should, that they should try to protect you from that. Yeah. yeah. And well, and you know, one of the other things I said in my talk on Monday, and I always say this, you know, the best things happen outside the comfort zone. Mm. And, you know, it's true. When I first thought, okay, I'm going to see my ex-husband, you know, my stomach did a flip, like, uh, you know, it's, it's stressful to, yeah. to sometimes make those leaps. Right. And then uh, again, you know, very seldom do I make a leap like that, that I regret it very seldom. And usually it ends up being, a really great thing is revealed when you take those risks. So you brought up comfort and, you know, this, you know, dealing with discomfort, dealing with uncomfortable things. And it makes me think this is a thread that, that we've sort of had on this, on this show. I've talked to a couple of different um, musicians, professional musicians, and about the process they went through to sort of make it as a musician and, and how you know, their art was inspired by a certain set of things that then changed when they achieved success, or some of them changed and some of them didn't. So that's one thing I'm interested in with your work. I mean, you've achieved tremendous success, um, but you don't see, I mean, I or not many people, and not the same number of people know you now that knew you before, right? Um, but how right. has life and your work changed as you become public? Uh, your profile as you've developed this platform, as, as you've achieved financial security, um, moved into a, a role as a parent, all those things. How does that change your relationship to your work? It's such an interesting question because honestly, I can, I feel very clear and maybe this is unfortunate. I don't know that I feel like my relationship to my work has not changed. Okay. I still feel riddled with self-doubt and fear and anxiety about writing. Will people will people love it? And then I always have to go through that same cycle of, of acknowledging that there's nothing I can do about it, whether they do or not. I can only do what I can do. I can only write my best work to try to, to try my hardest to create work that feels like the right thing to me, that feels meaningful to me, that feels like uh, I'm, I'm doing what I, what I hope to do as a writer and an artist in the world. And it's really not up to me uh, how that's received by others. I don't have any actual control or power over that. And this is what I always went through as a writer, those same 
that same cycle of, I guess, doubt uh, and acceptance, doubt and acceptance, and always maintaining the stance of humble persistence. And, and that's true. That was true when I was agonizing over writing my first book, Torch, and thinking, maybe I can't do it. You know, mm -hmm. maybe it's just too hard. Maybe right. it's too much. And what if everyone rejects me and all, you know, all those things. And that I finally just persisted and did it. And that's how I wrote Wild. And that's how I wrote Tiny Beautiful Things. And that's how I wrote every essay and story I've ever, I've ever written <laughs> is, you know, doubt, acceptance, surrender, really surrender to the process and come what may. And that's what I'm engaged in right now as I work on my next book. And so I love that, uh, of course, you're right. I've had this, my career has has changed entirely in terms of the number of people who read my work or who are aware of me, uh, that the whole, you know, my career now as a public speaker that was yeah. born out of that work, all, you know, all of those things, getting to go to the, you know, uh, the Oscars and having the movie, you know, on and on and on. And yet, the, the real work, just I'm sitting here in my attic office in Portland, Oregon, talking to you right now. And I'm just, I'm just here in this room doing what I've been doing since I was like 18 or 19, yeah. trying to tell a story, trying to craft a sentence, trying to make a feeling on the page. And uh, that's, that's a very unchanged part of my life. I would suppose that clarity allows you to keep doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I never think like, it's, it's always funny to me when people say, well, did you know that Wild was going to be a bestseller? And, you know, nobody knows that sure. anything's going to yeah. be a bestseller. And, and if you are sitting there writing something that you think is going to be a bestseller, I would say you're, you're doomed, <laughs> you know, because I mean, it, writing just doesn't work that way. You can only do what, what you, you can only do your best work and, and what happens to the work in the world isn't really up to you. Although therein is sort of this, another kind of form of contradiction contradiction in the sense right you I mean you you've talked about how for your writing to work it has to be it has to get to the, the 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 deepest darkest innermost truth and that you can't be thinking about what others will think of it um yet it, yet that matters too and that's important too in the sense that you know, the more it resonates with other people, the more people read it, the, 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 the more your message gets shared, the more influence you have, the bigger platform you have um, to share that message more broadly. Uh, it's interesting that the, the, this highly, um, and I mean this in the, in the most positive way possible, this highly self-centered process of finding this truth is the best, or it appears to be the best way to serve others with your writing. Does that, does that make sense? Absolutely. And, and I, I should say too, that's, it's true whether you're actually writing about the self as I did in wild or, or you're writing fictional characters that as I did in my first book, Torch, which is a novel, you know, you do have to say, you, you have to go really inward and say, I'm going to try to create these characters, or I'm going to try to make my actual self alive on the page as a character in a way that, that, uh, that feels real and feels powerful and meaningful and palpable. And, and when I say that, that um, you can't, you know, decide you're going to craft a bestseller, or you can't get fixated on what people are going to think. I, I don't mean by any stretch that so much of what I'm trying to do when I'm writing is to please others and to, to, to reach others, you know, and, but, but I can only do that if I really essentially please myself. If I say to myself, does this description seem like the right one? Does this, does it sound like this is what the character would actually say? Or do, sure. have I really revealed my deepest truth here? Have I written the sentence that says I swallowed my mother's ashes, right? And so that is about a very, um, a very personal kind of interrogation or examination. And, and I have fi found that, you know, if it pleases me, if I find that I've written when I say I've given it all or written to my own satisfaction, um, even if I always think, oh, I wish I could do a little bit better. Uh, you know, when I get to that place where I'm satisfied, I can usually trust that other people will be too. Do you use, you know, do you use readers to, to help you get there or, you know? Oh yeah. yeah I yeah. mean, absolutely. I, I, my husband is always my first reader. Um, he's just tremendously helpful. Brian Lindstrom is my husband and he's actually come to Missoula a couple of times showing, 
his documentary films at the Big Sky. Yeah, yeah, we've quite uh, a vibrant uh, uh, film scene here in Missoula. Absolutely. Yeah. So he's he's wonderful, and he's always my first reader and my best reader. And I have also writer friends. Sure. Who you know read my work, and my editor, who's amazing, Robin Desser, who has just given, you know, she just really reads very deeply and can talk to me about my work in a way that that always takes it up a notch. Absolutely. So kind of, you know, I want to be respectful of your time. It sounds like you said you're up in your, up in your attic, writing away, trying to work on your, your next thing. And that kind of is, is my question is, you know, what's next for you? I mean, you, you have, you have wild and you have, you know, a couple other compilations of your work. Torch. Well, Torch, wild. but you know, what's Tiny the... Tiny Beautiful Things and Brave Enough. Brave Enough. Books. That's the one. Brave Enough was, that was like 2015. It's a compilation yeah. of, of quotes, which gosh, yeah. we don't have time to get into all that, but what's uh, what's kind of the next big thing that you're you're thinking about at this point in your career? The next big thing is I have to finish my next book. Right, right. <laughs> which so it's hard uh, enough to do. I've I know, mean, it's, it's I know enough not to, to ask. It. Yeah, I know enough not to ask when that's supposed to be due. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's it, you know I'm really gunning to finish it uh, this year. So I mean by 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 this year I mean like really finish it by the summer. Of course, there's always revisions, but get that final full draft done by mid July. I have a, I have a deadline. I have a goal and I'm, I'm trying to do that and doing it. And, um, it's another memoir. Excellent. And do yeah. deadlines help for you? Is that part of, I know you've talked about various styles and you kind of had to find the right style for that works for you as a writer, but I assume deadlines have to help in some regard. Yeah. I think sometimes deadlines have been incredibly useful for me and other times not when I'm first writing a book I need a little more loose time because I do discover so much along the way as I'm writing. And I think a deadline would really thwart that process. But there is a time in the process where I say, okay, I really have to hand over this book. And so I'm there right now. I, I really, my inner scolding person is saying, get it done, get yeah, to work, the whip and is out. hand it over. Right on. Well, I would love to close. A lot of our listeners are students and members of this uh, university uh, community, and, and I've, I've heard you say and write in other places that you know to, to be a writer, you just got to do you got to do the work, do the hard work. Um, any other words of wisdom for young folks here in Missoula and beyond that are that are trying to find their way, trying to figure out how to get to their most inner truth? Yeah. Well, I think this is true at all times of your life, but I, I think it's especially important to to know when you're young, when you're in your late teens and early 20s and trying to figure out what you're going to do uh, in the next era of your life, in your early adulthood. And one thing that I've known to be true in both my own life and the lives of many others is that you really have to uh, pursue your curiosities and your interests. Don't listen to anyone else who's telling you what you should major in or what you should do after college or what profession you should take because it's reasonable or practical. I know so many people who have made the mistake of trusting those other voices. Uh, and then in midlife, they look back and said, well, I always really wanted to be this or that or the other thing. And I think I just always want to encourage people to pursue their dreams. And almost always when you follow your curiosity and your passion, you will land somewhere good because you'll be truly engaged with your work. It won't just be a job. It'll be part of your life. And I really am always hoping people will trust that, trust that truth that is within them. Yeah, that's certainly the nut we're trying to crack here at the University of Montana. And uh, it's great to hear that message coming from you as well. Cheryl, I can't thank you enough for the time. Again, uh, this conversation uh has just fired me up about your work and the work of, of, of the, the power of literature in general. And maybe we can get get you back to Missoula for a book reading of this new memoir that we can expect. The next book. Exactly. Okay, I just have to finish it first, and I would happily come back to Missoula. So nice to talk to you. Yeah, thank you, Cheryl. Best of luck. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Hope you enjoyed that conversation with Cheryl as much as I did. She just has a way of getting to the heart of an issue, and it's just been amazing to see the uh, not only the the power of her writing, but the success that she's built and the platform that she's been able to um, to kind of rise up to and, and and seize the opportunity that's presented itself with an important voice. Um, anyway, 
next week. We have we shift gears a little bit, and we have a really fun episode with Ryan Tutel and Coulter Nuanez. These two guys are sort of the uh, you know multimedia sports superstars of the Missoula community, Western Montana. Really, you know their afternoon program on ESPN Radio just kind of holds the market uh, for sports, both nationwide and regionally. They can uh, they can dig into any topic and make it relevant to any listener in the region. Uh, they also have a podcast through Coulter's Enterprise Skyline Sports, and they're doing a ton of stuff to kind of move the needle on the sporting front here in Western Montana. I look forward to that conversation with Ryan and Coulter next week. Remember that a new angle was brought to you by CED, Consolidated Electrical Distributors. By now, you've been listening long enough to know that these guys are big and that they sell pretty much everything electrical you would ever need. But you might not know that they hire a ton of University of Montana students. If you want to learn more about careers at CED, visit cedcareers.com. It's a great website name. Before we go, I want to thank some important peeps. Comzar, Elizabeth Willie, interns, Aspen Runkel, Mason Dow, and Max Gibson. Huge thanks to VTO for the tunes, and finally props to Jeff Meese, our master of all things sound. Before we go, if you have any questions, suggestions, comments, insults, whatever, please email me at anewangle at umontana.edu. Help us spread the word and be sure to use the hashtag a new angle when you do. Thanks a lot. See you next time.